you, sir. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I figured I should preface this with a question. Um, who here in this room happened to have seen a video of a talk that I gave recently where I didn't talk but sang? Sweet, okay, good. I'm very thankful, because I was desperately afraid that you all showed up expecting me to sing tonight. Um, so I'm glad that that's not the case. Um, <clears throat> all right, there's a story there. Um, I was in Germany at a, giving a talk. Um, the night before, someone gave a really inspirational talk about overcoming fear and all this stuff. And I woke up the next morning and thought, oh my god, I got to do something else. I know, I'll sing my talk. Terribly horrible and frightening thing to, to do before you're going to go on. Uh, turned out it was pretty awesome, and it was super fun to do. Um, but I'm not going to sing tonight, so at least not yet. You never know. You never know. I'll tell you that much. You never know. Um, so this talk tonight is called Design is About Relationships, and it fundamentally underlies basically my uh, approach to designing products for people. At the end of the day, Everything that we're doing is converging around this notion that the technology and all of the apps and all of the smart stuff we have in our lives actually, at the end of the day, is really about improving our lives, improving our ability to connect with other humans, and finding new and unique and interesting ways to make that experience even, uh, even better. There's a, a huge convergence that's been happening recently um, I'd say probably over the last three years or so at least, if not more, uh, around what it means to design for the web, quote unquote. Um, I think everyone here hopefully probably has a notion that the web as we know it is expanding and morphing and changing. And whereas we used to design websites, today we're building and designing products that span the web, mobile devices, toasters, uh, refrigerators, cars, you know, it, it's an embedded experience in all of our lives in multiple facets. So I thought we'd start by talking about a little definition. What is design? Well, according to the dictionary, design is a plan or a drawing produced to show the look and function or workings of building, garment, other object uh, before it is made, which I think is Okay, definition. And an alternate one from uh, Merriam-Webster is, uh, or the verb, I should say, is to decide upon the look and, and the functioning of one of those things, typically by making a detailed drawing of it. Um, I think this happens to be a little bit narrow, but um, I thought I would ask you guys, the audience, what is design? What is design to you guys? Anybody? Anybody? Really? How it works. Everything by implementation. Yep. Ooh. I, mm. I strongly disagree, but that's a great uh, answer. <laughs> What's that? Spirit. The spirit of something, okay. Relationship. No, smart ass. <laughs> He's a friend, don't worry, I won't call all of you. Uh, experience. The experience, okay. Problem solving. Okay, creating something from nothing so that you can interact with it. Back there. Show, don't tell. Okay. Personality. Personality. Communication. Communication. Those are great. Everything. <laughs> Back there, there's a big, there's a hand waving. <laughs> I, the framework on which the experience is fashioned. Okay. Creative purpose. The pur the creative purpose. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Mueller Brockman. Uh, which is a Twitter account, uh, and I can't remember who it's run by. I believe it's run by uh, someone in the family from Joseph Mueller Brockman, um, asked this question, what is design? And so here's a few answers that other folks had, which was design is rethinking our experience. Um, it's innovation and communication. It's the manipulation of form and content. It's value. It's dialogue. Design is philosophy arriving at elegance. I don't know. Some days that feels really good. <laughs> and other days I want to slap myself. OK. Uh, d design is giving order to context and content. Uh, it's to solve a problem. 
And my favorite, I just don't know anymore. Uh, and someone else in, in the audience expressed uh, that very well when they said everything. Um, Herbert Simon, who is a, a per, pretty well-known professor from Carnegie Mellon and um, fairly influential social scientist uh, in the last 100 years, he said design is devising courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And I think that was actually a really excellent definition of design. And my favorite, obviously, is from Paul Rand, which is Design is Relationships. Um, if you haven't seen this book before, strongly encourage you to pick it up. It's called Conversation with Students, and it was taken toward the end of his life um, and career and, uh, as he spent a bunch of time with uh, some art students. And the, the kind of wisdom packed in this thing is amazing. Anyways, and plug was not paid for that, by the way. Um, so if design is relationships, it's probably worthwhile uh, defining what is relationship. What is it? It's the way in which two or more people or concepts um, or objects are connected, the state of being connected. I think that's an interesting uh, point that we'll come back to some more. Um, it's also a connection, association, or involvement, an emotional or other connection between people. And I want to point out the emotional part of this because it, it underlies a ton of what we'll be talking about here is that at the end of the day, there is a very deep and very uh, subconscious and emotional impact that what we do and what we build has. And a lot of it comes down to the way that we as humans, we operate, the way we think, the way we're built, all of our mechanisms for interacting with people and how much that actually applies to the other things, the inanimate things or the semi-animate things that we, we have in our lives. I'll come back to that some more, but I just want to put that out there uh, for you guys. So Paul Rand went a little further and said, uh, design is a relationship between form and content. And a lot of people um, have reiterated this in various forms over the years. I believe it is absolutely true. And one of the reasons why and I could have chosen a ton of uh, other examples, but I thought I would stay true to our roots. Um, the CSS Zen Garden. Dave Shea, back in the early 2000s, designed this uh, very simple HTML document and essentially said, hey, I'm going to prove the power of CSS. I'm going to prove that you can take any, uh, I, you can take this content and you can style it or present it in any way based on the technologies we have available to us. You also have to remember this is pre-CSS3, so there weren't very many rounded corners and uh, gradients. <laughs> if they were, they were background images. But um, it's an amazing, uh, if you think about this, this is over 10 years old for some of these. And this is the same content, OK? Exactly the same content. That, that HTML document is structured exactly the same way the only thing that changed is the design, so the images and the, the styling done through CSS. Each of them evokes a totally different response. Um, some of you guys are giggling. Uh, you move forward, and about three years ago, Microsoft uh, approached Jason Santa Maria to do uh, the Lost World's Fair, which was this little uh, fictitious site. And what they were trying to do was highlight how awesome IE9's uh, web font technology was, which, to be fair, in 2010, it was actually pretty damn good. Um, and so Nas Hamid, Frank Shumero, and Jason Santa Maria, along with the guys from Paravel, set about designing and building these amazing, responsive, mind you, uh, designs. It's just stunning in their, in their approach and how they work. So this was like the default small screen experience, but um, you know, the responsive version of it spread out in crazy ways. And so these guys were starting to push on this notion of like, what does it mean to have content that can be flexible? What does it mean to have content that's related in some way, shape, or form to the other pieces of content on the page? And how do you, how do you design these experiences in a way where they're fluid and regardless of what the space or the size of the container is, they retain a connection to one another. This is Frank's, um, I can't remember, I want to say it was something like 60,000 pixels tall, um, something like that. It was, it was pretty impressive. Um, all 
CSS and some very smart uh, background image techniques that those guys did. Anyways, this goes for a long, long time. Uh, no, nope. good try. Uh, that requires more of this, so. But you can also skip over to something like uh, Flipboard. And Flipboard is really interesting to me because Flipboard took content that existed in other places, took the data, somewhat structured, and redesigned it, if you will. Gave it a different presentation, gave it a different relationship to other content on the page. And you can see that the way they approached it was very unique in that it was aware of the other types of content on the screen. So each one of these blocks is actually aware that the other ones are on the screen. And depending on which combination you have, different uh, variations in layout would occur. And, you know, I would say that Flipboard's been pretty successful. They have, uh, uh, I would say, a lot of um, accolades and a lot of people believe that it's a very beautiful experience, myself included. And to me, it was just amazing because a lot of this stuff came from my Twitter feed, which when you look at the Twitter version of it, it's very bare bones and 140 characters. There's nothing wrong with it. Same data, completely different presentation. But the relationship of the content on the page serves to change the experience, make it much more vivid, make it something that people are compelled to immerse themselves in. Uh, Paul Rand also said that design is a system of proportions, which means the relationship of sizes. And this one's interesting because as a designer, this is absolutely one of the most important things you can learn is hierarchy, just period. Like, if you take a plain text document that has a title and a heading and body copy, there is inherently a relationship of sizes that helps you understand what is the, mo you know, the difference between these things. Otherwise, it just blurs together as a blob of text. Um, but by simply having a relationship between sizes of things, and this could be the size of a photo to the size of the text that's with it, whether it's a caption or a title, like they're you know, very different things. One of, the, one of the most famous is the golden ratio. It's 1 to 1.618 and a whole bunch of other uh, decimal places. It's seen in everything from uh, seashells to Greek architecture to the Apple logo. Um, I almost pulled the one up the other day. I don't know if you guys saw it. Um, somebody made a joke about how the, the grid can be applied to anything, and they took Steve Jobs' picture and just put a grid over it. <laughs> um, an interesting one is uh, the, the previous version of Twitter, where we had the detail pane, which slid in and out. And it was very interesting. The detail pane had a, a responsive uh, size to it. So if you had a big, big monitor, it actually spread out to be pretty wide. And if you're on a smaller monitor, it's squeezed in to be this beautiful, nicely proportionate design. We found actually a Twitter that, uh, oh, by the way, I used to work at Twitter. Um, that gives you some context. Uh, we found that in the wider view, it was actually really, really hard to understand the hierarchy on the page because almost everything felt like it was the same hierarchy and the same weight and same priority largely because certain people wanted bigger photos and bigger media, which nothing wrong with that, but what it did is throw off the balance of the entire application and people became very confused as to what they were supposed to be paying attention to. Fortunately, we were able to move it back to this, at which point the entire design team collectively sighed in relief. And probably four months later, we redesigned it. So I guess it's all, you know, it's all moot. But um, another great example, Tim Brown, awesome guy, works at Typekit, um, obsesses about typography and web type typography in particular at a level that um, makes me look like I don't know anything. And uh, Tim created a modular scale, a small little application. He didn't create the modular, modular scale as an, as an idea. It's been around for a very long time. Um, but he applied it to, um, oops, sorry about that, applied it to, uh, some web design stuff in, in the context of a, uh, a simple document that illustrated how you could use the, uh, the tool. And all he was trying to reinforce was type is 
essentially one of the most fundamental pieces of your design. And if you build your design out from there and you create a system of proportions, your text, the image sizes, all of these pieces are actually related in a harmonious way and it allows you to have a system that's flexible where everything still retains that harmony no matter what context it's put in. And about six years ago, Mark Bolton wrote an awesome article where he talked about incremental letting. Again, not a brand new concept, but for a lot of us working on the web, it was bringing print, uh, you know, three, four, five hundred years of print design and expertise into what we were doing. And it was great because you've got these little sidebar pull quotes and whatnot that are not as important as the body copy. Um, and from a hierarchy standpoint, if you set these up right, five lines of that text will match up with four lines of your, of your actual body copy. Now, to a lot of people, that is like the strangest thing in the world and why should I care ever? The amazing thing is you show people the difference between someone who's done this type of work and applied that to the text document and one that hasn't been thought through and literally is just everything's the same size. The ability to read, the ability to comprehend, the ability to understand which is supporting and which is primary, all of it comes through these kind of relationships. Now, since we're talking about typography a little bit, I think one of the interesting things around this whole notion of design is about relationships is the relationship between typography, the font you choose, and the content that it's going to represent. Uh, some people spend their whole lives focusing on just this one thing, and I think those are some of the most incredible people I know because their detail-orientedness is astounding. But here's a great example. <laughs> Crisis in Italy deepens as bond yields hit records highs. <laughs> Amassing wealth in the US without any, you know, it's just like, really? Like you read that and you can't even take it seriously. Why? Because of the typeface it's set in has nothing to do with the content. The content is absolutely important, engaging, depending on what your interests are. The Dow was down, I don't know, you know. But you set it in Comic Sans and suddenly you can't take it seriously. You don't trust it, you don't want to look at it for very long, and so you're gone. And this fundamentally underlies all of what we do. So you see a lot of these applications, you know, I would imagine many of you guys are currently either building or designing or building and designing uh, products. One of your greatest brand assets is the font you choose. And the reason is it's all over your stuff. So you happen to choose Tahoma, which is not my first choice ever. Um, <laughs> but you know what, if you're Facebook and the majority of your audience is on Windows, and Tahoma is the default font, and it's what they're used to, and it's what makes them feel like they're using their computer, that's a really strategic decision where you're trying to evoke a relationship or capitalize on a relationship that those people have with their computer already. And all I'm saying is you get a whole lot of branding out of just the typeface you choose. Another great example of the relationship that we're talking about here in proportions, size. Um, Graham Smith, who's a designer uh, over in, I believe he's in London, he found this old branding document from VW. And it's amazing. There's, a, there's this little guide down here on the bottom. So K is equal to 8.5% of D, right? And B is 10% of D, and A is 2.5 of D. And you're sitting there and you're like, okay, what? Except it's amazing, this whole entire system that they've created with guidelines around how this piece of branding should be used and treated and how it relates to any other content all comes down to proportions. I love it. All right, personal example here. Yes, that says not philanthropo, it is philanthropu. Uh, some very good friends of mine and I uh, worked on a project called World Poopin' Day. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Twitter has this wonderful little thing called hashtag poopin, or just poopin, uh, where if you leave your phone unlocked and your friends grab it, the odds of them typing poopin and hitting uh, submit are very high. Um, and so anytime you see the word poopin on a tweet in your timeline, it usually means somebody left their phone unattended. We capitalized on this by creating a, a campaign around awareness for clean water. Uh, we had some friends who were doing work in Haiti at the time, 
and South by Southwest was coming up. This was a couple years ago. And so we decided we were going to uh, do some, some work around this. First thing I did was a branding exercise. And so I wanted to show you how the typography and the relationship of size and proportion played out in this whole experiment or project. So here's the lowercase o. Man, I wonder where that could be. Oh, look at that. There's our mark. Boom. Branding. You're capitalizing on something that's already existing in the typeface that we used for the whole project. And it's subtle. Most people would never put that connection together. But it allowed me to quickly tie the typeface we were using and the mark that we were using for the branding together. Um, the very interesting story that goes along with this is uh, during South by Southwest, we had a dinner. And I ended up sitting next to Patricia Arquette. Uh, who had a, a foundation that she had started that was doing amazing charity work in Haiti. And she was about to take another group of people down. And she's sitting there telling me about these kids, like after the earthquake and how because of Twitter, uh, one child six months later was reunited with her mother because of Twitter. Like someone was able to track this kid down and find them and put them in contact in the whole nine yards. And so it was this amazing convergence of like, wow, I did this really goofy, silly design project for a really kind of cool you know, uh, campaign. And here I am sitting next to this person. And like, she's inviting me to come to Haiti to do a trip and go help these kids. And you, know, you just realize this world is way more connected than we may want to acknowledge. Everything we do has this amazing ripple effect. And it's not always obvious or evident. But man, in the moments when it is, it really is staggering. So I want to jump in and start talking a little bit about design being about relationships and get even more specific. What I really want to focus on is people and content and devices. Right now, the world population just clicked over. Actually, by now, it's probably, I can't remember. They have a clicker going. It is just bananas. But yes, so over 7 billion people on this planet. You want to hear what's crazy? 6.8 billion mobile subscribers. OK, so that obviously means that babies aren't being born with iPhones. OK, so like, <laughs> that's not the case. Although, <laughs> ah. um, but seriously, most people tend to own one or more devices. And so that accounts for that kind of discrepancy there. But what it should tell you is that there's a lot of people on this planet that have phones that are connected to a mobile plan um, in the developing world, in the developed world, and everywhere in between. And you see that it's embedded in, our, in every culture, not just our culture. I mean, this one is my favorite. I'm assuming he's not taking a vow of silence. So you start getting into stuff like this, and you, you realize, like, OK, so what's the context for all this? Twitter's over 250 million active users. Facebook, 1.1 billion as of last week or two weeks ago, which is just staggering. 56% um, of American adults own a smartphone. Good job, parents. Uh, nearly 67% uh, of users access Facebook through their uh, mobile device. Over 60% access Twitter on their mobile device. This is, chart is awesome, and it's super old, like two years old. But uh, this is iPhones. This is iPads. And that's two years ago, guys. And it is just like bananas since then. But what it's showing you is that people are very interested in having a portable, on-demand, connected and personalized consumption experience. And that is where all of what we're doing, whether it's design or engineering or anything in between or all of it combined, that's where it's heading. And the hard part is that huh, there's not one screen. Browser wars look like a cakewalk compared to the device uh, fragmentation we deal with now. 250 million photos per day on Facebook. Seriously, people. Put your phone down, play with your children. <laughs> 2.5 billion pieces of content on Facebook every day, 400 million tweets per day. Tons of them have links. Uh, Tumblr, this one actually blew my mind. 20 billion total posts, 50 million blogs, and 72 million posts per day. It's just like an insane amount of content, content being produced every day. 70% of mobile users update, or I mean, uh, social network folks. They do so. They post from their mobile device. 
So seriously, I know you're like, great, stats are neat. I usually try to avoid them, but this is for a point. The point is... I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Oh, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Wake up, Toto, you're not in Kansas anymore. Jesus, are you startled me? I definitely don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. I don't think we're in the food chain anymore, Dorothy. <laughs> Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Mm. Seriously, we are not in Kansas anymore. Um, there's a little piece of me that kind of longs for 10 years ago. Um, in retrospect, it was a lot simpler to build things in some ways, like it's this bizarre trade-off, right? Like the technologies we build on have become easier to use and faster to get out there, but the number of places we have to support those things has exponentially multiplied. So all this is just pointing out that uh, disruption will only accelerate. The quantity of, and diversity of connected devices, many of which haven't even been imagined yet, like your toaster and your, your uh, refrigerator, Many of them, which we haven't imagined yet, will explode, as will the quantity and diversity of the people around the world who use them. Our existing standards, workflows, and infrastructure will not hold up. This is part of the future-friendly manifesto. If you haven't read this, I highly suggest that you go Google it tonight, future-friendly. So a small group of extremely uh, brilliant designers and developers that are doing some very forward-thinking uh, writing and, and talks around how we can support the past and how we can begin to embrace the kind of like coming device apocalypse. One of the first people that I think really tapped into this was Dieter Rams. Dieter Rams is uh, definitely one of my design heroes. And he talked a lot about designers needing to be avant-gardists, needing to be people who were looking ahead of the curve and that were, that were able to question the things that were generally obvious whether or not they actually should continue to be the way they are. Um, there was a, there's a, uh, what would you call it, uh, an intuition for people's, uh, and when I say people, I mean like the general population, kind of their trends and their tastes. And, and what it really comes down to, and Dieter Rams was famous for talking about this, and even more so in the products that he chose to build, he talked about understanding people's dreams understanding their desires, uh, their needs, their worries, how they lived, so the habits of their daily life. And I hate to say this, but I don't think we do enough of that right now. There's a lot of designers and a lot of researchers I know that would definitely agree with this statement. Uh, but even those folks, myself included, I don't think that we're thinking deeply enough about those contexts. We've got to be able to act, you know, kind of like, assess the, the boundaries of the technology that we're work, working with, which means as designers, it's important that we're at least somewhat technologists. Um, whether If we're not builders, we'd better be fairly versed and articulate in the technologies themselves. Um, I'm a huge proponent of designer builders and builder designers and like everything in between. And if you specialize in one thing, have relationships with people who do the other end of it, it's going to make all of you better in the end. Um, but Dieter Rams, I mean, the stuff he built is timeless. It's classic in its design and its functionality, in the elegance in which it's produced, the materials, all of these things. I mean, people are still using this stuff and putting it in their homes decades later. And so much of that comes down to the fact that he was paying attention to the relationship between the people and the objects he was creating. He was paying attention to how someone would have a stereo in their home, when they would walk by it, was it at a hand level, you know, was it intended to be down below where I got to get on my knees and fiddle with knobs? What, you know, like the, just all the nuances around how people used it and how it fit into their lives. And as designers, especially as digital designers and digital product people, uh, you know, this is the interface. This is the, the record player or the, you know, the, the what is that? Braun shaver, I think, actually. Is that really the shaver? Yeah, I think it is. But you know what I mean? Like this is the, the physical object through which everyone experiences our products. 
So it behooves us to spend a lot more time thinking about how people actually use these things. Um, a couple of years ago at the Future Web Design Conference, uh, in an era of new devices and platforms, we're not designing pages. And pages is a very leftover uh, analogy that we drew from traditional publishing from books. But we're designing systems of content relationships, flexible content. Mark Bolton, who is a designer in the UK uh, and does just absolutely fantastic work with his studio, he's talking about constraints here. He says, Rem uh, remember that the goal is connectedness. And if you go back to one of the definitions of relationship, it was that state of being connected. This feeling of belonging. You do that by defining the constraint from your content. The constraint would be derived from an advertising unit or from a thumbnail image or tons of legacy content, whatever it is. Start there. Don't start from an imaginary page. And this is just one kind of like pointer or you know, directional statement for all of us to be aware of. I think the, the bigger and more overarching point that I'd like to make is that a lot of relationships between things are actually uh, a, a result of constraints. So let's see, there we go. Instagram. How many of you guys are on Instagram? Wow, all right. Um, Instagram put one very critical constraint on what they did. They chose a square photo. Anyone here know why they chose a square photo? Because if you rotate the phone in any direction, it's the exact same experience. It's definitely, I think, a big part of it. Definitely plays to the nostalgia of the Polaroid. And in the composition experience, they're definitely leaning that way. So that's also another uh, big part of it. Do you want, I'll, I'll, I'll save the conversation. The really, really, really hard truth of why they chose a square. Because you know what? When you're designing activity streams for mobile devices, landscape versus portrait is a bitch. Portrait photos on this thing take up the whole screen. You can't see the user's name. You can't see the actions so that you can favorite it. You can't see any other content. Nothing but the giant portrait photo. Landscape, landscape's awesome because you can get two of them on the screen. OK, way to go. Good job. We got more content for screen. Every, anyone, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, anybody who's designed a feed knows or has had to deal with photos in a feed, let me put it that way, knows that the orientation thing is a huge issue. They decided, you know what? We're not even going to play that game. They're going to be squares. They're going to be squares. They're going to be awesome. They're going to give a nod to the Polaroid. We're going to do this whole flow where you feel like an artist, and we're going to win. But at the end of the day, their number one constraint was a square photo. Twitter, 140 characters. Twitter at 280 characters would not be the same thing at all. Small interesting piece of trivia, Facebook's character limit on their status message posts, 420 characters. I don't know, maybe. Uh, college kids were programming it. Come on, like, let's just be honest here. Uh, so Twitter, 140 characters, um, asynchronous or asymmetric following model. So I can follow you, but you don't have to follow me in order for there to be something happening there. And public by default. Those were the huge constraints that Twitter was birthed with, and they created the, the way in which content and people and all of the things on the service actually interact and, and relate to one another. And again, we can probably put up a dozen other things, but the point is constraints shape the types of relationships we have, both with one another and with the content and with the technology that we have. We have a deep, deep connection with the tools we use. And when I say tools, I'm not talking about Photoshop. Necessarily, I'm not talking about Illustrator or, or even the code environment you write in. Um, although, if you want to know what I think about those things, watch my talk from Beyond Tellerand talk, seeing thing. You'll get a really clear picture because um, I talk all about that in those. But in this case, our devices are like these old carpenter's tools. They give us, uh, it's like an extension. And if you think about it, it, if you've ever used a power tool or a hammer or a screwdriver or any of these things, they extend you. They're an extension of you. They allow you to do things that you can't do by yourself, but by your relationship to them, by your connection to them, you're able to do things that you couldn't do beforehand. 
And so, you know, we move into this era where these tools are now these devices that we live with. And we imbue them with a sense of humanity. Um, the first time I talked about this, people laughed and they thought I was crazy. But you realize, um, how many of you have yelled at your phone? Uh, how many of you have been like, what the, you know, because for whatever reason, it won't do the thing it's supposed to do. Um, how many of you guys, how many uh, Apple fans do we have in the audience? Yeah? Loyalty. That's a very human attribute, right? And we have loyalty to these very interesting pieces of metal and plastic and glass and whatnot. Um, they're extensions of ourselves. So of course we imbue them with those characteristics. Um, so if you look at one of Apple's advertising little campaigns, you see the way they've put it together. Voila. It says something. Here is an Android campaign. Some very bionic arms there. <laughs> Efficient for note taking. Bare knuckled bucket of does. <laughs> if you wrote that and you're in the room, <laughs> high five, because <laughs> you got that on a billboard all over the country. That's just amazing. Um, and then, you know, the nod to Terminator, right? And I don't know, if you go back and you start looking at Apple's campaign, you notice the focus is 100% on people. The device is there. It absolutely is. And there's a very clear distinction that they're saying this device allows you to be a part of this moment. This device allows you to capture it to share it. It allows you to see your children in a different light. It allows you to let other people see your children in ways that they couldn't have and be a part of a moment they weren't uh, physically present for. They, I mean, I will just say this. Apple is one of the most talented uh, production companies when it comes to these kind of storytelling and like they pull in that emotional heartstring. But what they're doing is just capitalizing on the fact that we're humans. We have emotions. And we have connections with these devices. And they know the more they play to that, the more they reinforce that this is me, right? Uh, Paul Adams said a couple of years ago, the web is being rebuilt around people. I don't know if it's being rebuilt, to be totally honest with you. I think that it's evolving and it's extending itself. And the primary central organizing principle is people. So like the social web is the web but it is a focus on the relationships that people have both with one another and with the companies and with the products and with the technology that enables all of those interactions. If this is true, which I believe it is, as designers, there's a few things we've got to start spending time really focusing on. One of them is compassion. A good friend of mine, uh, Kyle Sollenberger, uh, is one of the co-founders of this company, CoTweet, and Kyle, we had a lot of discussions a few years ago around what it meant to design a product for people in businesses, in enterprises. Um, and a lot of his job was actually doing customer service. He chose, as the designer and as the kind of like design-minded co-founder, to take on responsibilities of customer service. Myself, at the time, I was working at a company called SocialCast, and I did the same thing. I sat with, um, with our, our CMO a lot, and one of the gentlemen that's here in the audience, quite often, um, and talk to our customers. Listen to them articulate why it wasn't working, what the pain points were, how they worked, right? And knowing how someone already does something is actually really, really important because you can deconstruct from their points of failure. You can deconstruct things that you potentially wouldn't have seen yourself. And it gave us the ability to be compassionate and understand you know, what they're doing. Empathy is deeply connected to that, obviously. Another good friend of mine, um, began, he was working on a healthcare-related product. And he began testing his own glucose levels. He's not diabetic, but he's building a product for diabetics. And so in order to understand what they were going through every day, he began doing his own testing. And that to me was like one of those like, wow, I am shallow, holy cow. Like, man, good, like, I, 
but he was trying to understand, like, if I'm going to design a product for people who live with this day in and day out, I've got to experience it myself to be able to accurately and actively find ways to make it better. Connection. Connection's a huge piece of this. And, and the nuance of these things is so, so deep and intricate. This is a photo of the Apple Store in, uh, in Cupertino, I believe it's Cupertino, uh, whatever, whichever the one is, Palo Alto, thank you, um, right after Steve Jobs passed away. Here are thousands and thousands of post-it notes. Here is someone taking a picture with a device that Steve Jobs was responsible for bringing to the market of the notes to Steve, right? Like, so I know this is a probably extreme example, but the, these people had a deep and fundamental connection with Steve Jobs, a man that they had never met, a man they'd never spent any time with, but because of what he had done, what he had put his life into, had created a connection, both through technology and through the physical products he created. So it's not actually a stretch to say that what we do and what we make becomes a bond, becomes a connection between people who are using it and the people who create it. You can go back in history. Churches, temples, over time, all of these things were designed as a place for connection a place to be inspired, a place where others gathered together. We just managed to have created digital and, uh, you know, versions of these things in a lot of ways. And one of the last things is simplicity. And simplicity is the hard truth that, you know, most people don't actually want to spend all day using your stuff. Like, I, I will, I'm, I've, I've left Twitter, so I feel very comfortable saying this now. I actually don't want you to spend all day on Twitter. Pulled to refresh like five or six times, I was tempted to like suggest that we put in a, a, a little prompt that said, you should turn off your phone now. <laughs> Go outside. A um, little extreme, but you get the point. Um, here's a little app that's called Capture. This thing's amazing. You know what it does? It starts video recording the second you launch the app. Turns out, Apple's camera app is a pain in the butt to record video because you open the app, then you gotta slide the thing over and wait for it because it stalls, and then you gotta hit the thing, and by then your kid's not doing the thing they were doing. To illustrate why this is awesome, I bring you my daughter two years ago. Let down hair. Rapunzel, let down your hair. From the top, ready? One, two, two three, three, four. four. Just a song about Rapunzel. One of the most proud moments in my entire life. <laughs> I'm sitting in my daughter's room, playing along with her. She starts singing. I grab my phone, hit the capture app, and launch it set the thing in my lap and immediately start recording. And had I not had Capture as an app, I guarantee you I wouldn't have been able to capture that in that moment. And so it's things like that. It was a long way. Two years later, I watch that and every single time I'm borderline like either want to cry or like start singing along, one or the other, because it's just kind of awesome. So going along with this is delight. And designing for delight, honestly, I can do a whole talk on that, and in fact, a number of my friends have given whole talks on that. Doug Bowman, who's a creative director over at Twitter, he uh, had a talk that he gave in New Zealand a couple years ago. It's fantastic if you want to look it up. Good friend of mine, uh, Matthew Smith, designed this site for Blue Sky Resumes. Resumes, not traditionally delightful, it turns out. Kind of bland and boring. It was pretty amazing. After putting that design out there, the number of monthly proposals went up by 15%. The increase in clients, 65%, and the overall increase in revenue, 85%, because the whole site was playful. Everywhere you went, there was just these little teeny moments of delight and fun that were baked into the experience. Delight is something that provides a source of happiness, or my favorite as the verb, to hold spellbound. Something I strive for, and I think as designers, it's absolutely, and engineers, to be totally honest with you, those little teeny nuances of that one transition and that animation, right? That's that thing that holds your users captive and just keeps them engaged. 
Turns out users are accustomed to not being delighted. So a little bit goes a long way. It's one of my favorites. Did you mean to attach some files? Because you wrote attached <laughs> in your message, but there are no files attached. Should we send it anyways? This was like the greatest thing, and whoever did this, I want to high five you and maybe buy you a beer. Because <laughs> before they put this in, I would send emails and immediately get an email back, where's the files? <laughs> Sorry, I hit send too fast. I got an itchy trigger finger. But honestly, in my opinion, we should challenge ourselves to go beyond not pissing our users off. The bar is too low, guys. There's a lot more we can do to engage and empathize with our users. Apps that just work, quote unquote, are delightful, it turns out. Stuff like Cloud App, it just works. Stuff like Google Search, it's insane how well it works. Dropbox, it just works. Granted, it usually chews your battery up and sometimes it takes forever to sync, but, um, but honestly, like, I'm, I'm giving them some, a hard time. But it, it is amazing that you don't have to think about it. It just works. Uh, Rands uh, said, good design isn't about making decisions for your users. It's about making those decisions irrelevant, which I love this quote. We had it printed in our office. You have to understand, though, that the drive for connection and relationship is a huge part of being human. It's subconscious in, it, in the way that it guides us. And for us to be able to fulfill a quote like this, we have to spend a lot more time understanding behavior, understanding motivation. Motivation is like an absolutely underserved uh, aspect of design. Uh, BJ Fogg, who's a professor at Stanford, writes and teaches about all this. And there's a ton of really useful stuff in there. But at the end of the day, it's really about spending time understanding the people who are using your products. So I'm going to kind of wind it down with this. This is, uh, most of you, I hope, would understand what this is. This is the old anchor tag and the old href. The href, traditionally, has been shortened version of hypertext reference. I would propose, going forward from today, you would all change the way you think that href is really a human reference. Because on the other end of every single one of those anchors is a human being. Someone clicked on that link for a reason. Someone was looking for something or someone. Or they needed to take an action. They needed to do something. Therefore, this was the mechanism and the conduit by which they were able to hopefully, and unfortunately not always, accomplish that. And when we as designers and developers, product people, when we begin to think of the human reference on the other side of everything we create, we will create products that are more human, more in sync with the way that we behave, more in sync with who we are as individuals. And ultimately, I believe and I hope, is going to create better things for our society, better ways of connecting, better ways of being human. Leave you with one last thought. Everything needs more love more attention, more, more care put into those moments of connection. And that's it. Thank you.